The Nintendo Game Boy, compared to the Sega Game Gear and Atari Lynx, the Game Boy was a technically inferior handheld, yet it became a household brand and shipped over 110 million units, completely dominating its competition. Nintendo's philosophy was never to be a leader in technology, rather get the best out of existing hardware. The Nintendo Switch continues this legacy today, utilizing the Nvidia Tegra X1 system on a chip that we first saw in 2015. But it was the Game Boy that first appeared back in 1989 that started it all. Gunpei Yokoi, the designer of the Game Boy, called its design lateral thinking of withered technology. The Game Boy used older technology to keep the cost affordable, but it was used in extremely innovative ways. Looking at the hardware, the Game Boy comes with a custom system on a chip that houses an 8-bit sharp processor clocked at 4.19 MHz. While it's similar to a Xilog Z80 and an Intel 8080, it's actually neither of them. It's something in the middle of these. The hardware contains just 8KB of RAM and 8KB of video RAM. That's right, I said 8 kilobytes. When developing on the Game Boy, one of the biggest challenges that programmers had to overcome was the limitations of the hardware. Yet many of them were able to overcome this and come up with some amazing results and some amazing technical achievements as far as the graphics go. Let's go ahead and take a look at the graphics system on the Game Boy and deep dive into some of the really cool effects that programmers were able to take advantage of. The Game Boy system on a chip is home to not just the CPU, audio hardware and I.O. It also houses the PPU or pixel processing unit. The Game Boy resolution is 160 pixels wide by 144 pixels vertically and it has four colors or I should say four shades of gray or green depending on what model Game Boy you are using. So let's do some quick math. We just said that the Game Boy has 8 kilobytes of VRAM and the size of the display is 160 by 144 pixels. If we use a traditional frame buffer approach to draw each pixel color value sequentially and render the frame buffer, we would need almost 23 kilobytes of RAM to do so. Remember, we only have 8 kilobytes of VRAM to work with. So how is this limitation overcome? Well, the Game Boy doesn't actually have a frame buffer at all, and it's not possible to just plot pixels on the 160 by 144 frame buffer individually. To conserve and optimize graphic space, all background images are assembled utilizing tiles. A tile is an 8x8 eight eight pixel square, which supports a palette of four colors. The Game Boy can store a maximum of 256 tiles in VRAM. We said that each tile is 8x8 eight eight pixels, this means that it's 20 tiles across by 18 tiles vertically, which would produce a full screen image. But this is actually 360 tiles, so how do we account for this? Tiles are reusable, so for example, any tile that's an empty space or a white tile wouldn't consume more VRAM than 8x8 pixels. If we take any Game Boy game and layer a grid over it to represent the tile offsets, you can see many tiles are repeatable. So the tile is only stored in VRAM once and is referenced as needed. This provides a significant memory saving as compared to a conventional frame buffer. In fact, the entire background tile set is stored in one of two possible memory locations in VRAM, which is accessible by the game. As it needs to draw the screen, it pulls the tile index it needs based on the memory location of the background tile data. It's also not necessary for games to need the entire 256 tiles for a game. Some games use less. For example, Super Mario Land only needs 128 tiles, which means more VRAM to do other things. Okay, so we have tile-based graphics. Now, this is something that's not unique to the Game Boy, so let's move on to something a little more interesting, background scrolling. When you play something like Super Mario Land, the background scrolls as you move Mario in the game. Essentially, moving the offset of all the tiles on the screen and introducing new ones as Mario is moved to the right. Although we said that the Game Boy draws 20 tiles across by 16 tiles down, in VRAM it's actually drawing 32 by 32 tiles and the Game Boy's display is used as a viewport. In other words, as you move Mario to the right, the viewport moves with it. And there are two registers to manipulate the scrolling of X and Y to move this viewport around. 
This is done per pixel and at 60 frames per second, so it's simple for the Game Boy to achieve a smooth scrolling effect. When a viewport hits the end of the tile set, it simply just wraps around. Tiles can also be loaded in before they are displayed. This means entire level data can be stored as tiles, and this effect is used in games that have level data larger than the 32x32 32 32 tile window. The game simply just brings in new tiles off screen as it needs them. And for other games that scroll in four directions like Turrican, tiles are drawn in both the X and Y coordinate space in advance. The Game Boy also has a window layer which is independent of the background tile layer and can scroll independently. The window layer can be enabled and disabled and contains its own X and Y position registers. This layer is usually for user interface such as score or status. It sits above the tile layer and is non-transparent. This is a very simple way to set up a static part of the screen and this window layer can also have its own palette independent of the background tile layer. It wouldn't be a game system without sprites. The Game Boy can have up to 40 sprites on screen at any given time. Each sprite is also 8 pixels by 8 pixels and can move independently of the tile and window layers. There can also only ever be 10 sprites on any given line at any time. Sprite data is also stored in VRAM much like the tile data and larger sprites can be pieced together from the 8x8 sprite data. Sprites can also be flipped horizontally and vertically without requiring to make a copy of a flip sprite which would use additional VRAM. They can also be set to 8 pixels wide by 16 pixels high, and sprites have their own palette independent of the other two layers. Okay, so we know that the Game Boy has sprites, backgrounds, and windows, and all three combinations of these can really come up with some good games. But in order to take graphics to the next level, Programmers started to use tricks mid-frame in order to manipulate scan lines and get some really cool demo style effects out of the Nintendo Game Boy. We said earlier that the Game Boy is tile based, but the LCD screen renders graphics line by line much like a CRT. When it reaches the end of the line, there is a small pause and moves on to the next line to draw. This time taken is known as the horizontal blank or H blank period. Once all 144 lines have been drawn, the time taken to jump back to line 1 and start drawing again is known as vertical blank. The Game Boy has a register known as LYC, which is used to compare the current scan line that's being rendered with whatever value is in the LYC register, and if they match, an LCD status interrupt occurs. And during this interrupt, other registers can be manipulated mid-frame in order to produce some cool and interesting effects. The intro in Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening is an excellent example of mid-frame H-blank register manipulation. On the surface, it looks pretty standard, but there's more here than meets the eye. First, let's look at the waves you can see that they are bobbing up and down at different speeds. The clouds are also scrolling at different speeds to give the illusion of distance. This is known as parallax scrolling and it's a subtle effect. So let's consider how the Game Boy may attempt to draw this. First, we know that we can easily scroll right by adjusting the viewport or the X scroll register known as SCX. In order to simulate the waves moving up and down, we can adjust the viewport slightly on the Y axis via the SCY register but this would mean that the clouds would also appear to move up and down as well. The game puts the value 64 in the LYC register. In other words, when the 64th scan line is drawn, it triggers an interrupt during H blank. During the interrupt, the code then simply shifts the position of the background after the clouds have been drawn, but before the waves. The amount shifted is to compensate for the adjustment in the viewport and then proceeds to draw the remaining scan lines. This means that the horizon and clouds don't move, but the waves do, in order to give the appearance of the storm. But we also have to talk about the parallax scrolling effect on both the clouds and waves. This is the same approach as before, as the scan lines are being drawn, the LYC register is updated to break at several different screen sections. From here, the same methodology is applied. When an interrupt is triggered, during H blank, the background is moved at different speeds by changing the SCX register to give the appearance of depth. 
On the Game Boy, Nintendo was very clever to add the LYC register in order to do these mid-frame manipulation tricks. If this register did not exist, everything would then scroll at the same speed and take away from the immersion. Here's what it would look like if there wasn't any mid-frame background manipulation. The rain effect has been created by simply generating sprites and placing them over the background tileset via a simple random number generation. And then by adding the ship and lightning sprites, our intro is complete. Very cool stuff. There was also some easy demo style effects that could be done simply by adjusting the SCX register mid-frame. Games could have some really cool demo style effects. The Game Boy also has some games that really show off the power of the hardware. Prehistoric Man is one game that not only has background and window manipulation, but relies on precision timing in order to pull off some stunning effects. Even a simple game like Tetris has been crafted beautifully. There's really nothing special about the game, but it uses the strengths of the Game Boy hardware exceptionally well. When pieces fall, they are sprites, which are then converted to tiles when they've fallen into place. And the next piece to fall is calculated by a simple random number generator that utilizes the divide register. And that's what makes the Game Boy such a fascinating system. The hardware was cheap and low powered compared to its competition and only four colors. Yet programmers used the hardware in ingenious ways to produce not only some of the best handheld games ever, but also technically impressive. And if you're a fan of the original Game Boy, let me know in the comments below what some of your favorite original Game Boy games are. So there you have it guys, that is the PPU of the Nintendo Game Boy. It's a fascinating topic to go back and revisit and one that's really something that I'm very much interested in. And you know, developers were really able to get the most out of the Game Boy given the really kind of minuscule requirements and, and specifications of the hardware itself that were really able to get some really cool effects out of the Game Boy. Now, obviously there's other things on the Game Boy that I haven't covered in this video, like the sound and more tricks with graphics as well. You know, there's a lot more to the Game Boy than just the, the graphics processing. There's, there's so much more there that it can do. But, you know, that's something that I'll probably look at in a future episode. But I'm very much interested in covering old retro systems and how they worked. So if you guys like this video and you want to see more, let me know in the comments below. I really want to hear your feedback on this one. Well, guys, we're going to leave it here. Thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, you know what to do. Leave me a thumbs up. And as always, don't forget to like and subscribe. And I'll catch you guys in the next video. Bye for now.